Okay, let's look at our objectives. Some of the things we want to do this time are to uh, discuss the TCPIP networking, and that's critical to understanding um, computer and network security because that's how um, computers talk to each other fundamentally across the network. There are other protocols that allow computers to talk to each other, but um, we're going to concentrate on TCPIP. Then we'll describe the threats to network security, the goals of network security. Uh, we'll talk about a layered approach to network defense and explain how network security defenses affect your organization. If you look right here and look, uh, talk about a layered approach, what do you think that means? Um, if you think about the old pictures of castles that you see, or if you've ever been, you know, visited Europe and seen one of the castles, the first thing you do when you approach the castle is what do you see? Is you see probably see a moat around the castle, and a moat is just a ditch that's filled with water, and it's wide enough where it's very difficult to get across without having some sort of a boat or floating pontoon-like contraption. And then, if you were able to get across the moat, what would you have there to defend yourself? Uh, the castle would have very high walls, and at the top of these high walls would be places where um, you could have, these are called battlements, where you could have uh, various types of uh, weaponry that could be used to fend off various types of attacks. If someone were able to get inside that, oh, and a very good example of this is, I forget which, uh, which, uh, <clears throat> which Lord of the Rings <clears throat> had a, um, had a uh, castle, I think it was the third one. And it, the, um, it was attacked by, I forgot what the names of those <coughs> people were. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyway, once you get inside the castle, then you have other sorts of uh, walls and uh, various places uh, where the uh, attackers would have to get through. Well, as it turns out, you have the same sort of thing when you talk about your network architecture and network defenses. You have various layers, so what you're essentially doing is, is you're making it very difficult for someone to attack your network because they have to get through multiple layers of defenses. And we'll talk about all of those in this class. Okay, so what is uh, TCP IP? As I indicated before, it's Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol, and it's shortened to TCP IP. And it's actually a suite of many different protocols that are including, included within this. And we'll talk about some of those shortly. For example, within TCP IP, you have various layers, as we'll see shortly, of uh, <clears throat> various layers of what we call the TCP IP stack. And, um, and then within that, we have various protocols such as ICMP, which is more commonly known as ping to most of you. Uh, and within TCP IP, we also have TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, which is really a connection oriented protocol um, that allows for error correction of uh, information transmitted over a network. And we have IP, which actually gets the uh, packet that we're sending from one station to another, from one computer to another. And then at the top layer, we'll see that we have application layer protocols that are for specific applications, such as, if you think for a second, what would be the name of uh, one at the application layer, one that you use every day probably? Let's say to check our mail, if we use web mail, or to check our web pages. HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And so all TCP IP does is it allows information, that is packets, as you recall from um, previous uh, talks about networking, is that information travels in packets across networks. Well, TCP IP allows packets to be transmitted from point to point on a network. And when we say point to point, it could be straight from one computer to another, or it could be from a computer to a gateway router, to a series of other routers, to another gateway router, and to the other computer. If we're talking about uh, moving something over a WAN, of course, we're going to be talking about uh, <clears throat> multiple computers that are handling those packets. Okay, what is the OSI model? There's really two different models of the TCP IP, uh, <coughs> of TCP IP. The OSI model is the Open Systems Interconnect model which was created, I believe, in the 80s as a way to try to conceptualize or try to explain how TCP IP works. Notice that it works in a layered format. We have layers here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You will need to remember that. And the layers start at the most specific, um, that's most closely um, 
At the wired level is the physical layer. We have the data link layer, network, transport, session, presentation, and application. Notice over here too we have something called the TCP IP model. And that's essentially uh, another abstraction or another way of trying to explain how networking works, but looking at it from a slightly different point of view. And essentially what the TCP IP model does is it takes what we have over here and kind of combines some of the segments over here. So there's <clears throat> under the OSI model where you can explain some of the things that occur at the physical level and data link level. All of that is connected over here in the TCP IP model in something called the network interface level. If we move up one level over here we have the network layer. Well if that's synonymous with the internet layer in the TCP IP model. And if you look up here it shows you some of the specific protocols that are involved in the internet layer. And there's the IP layer, the internet protocol, ICMP, internet control, oops, internet, excuse me, internet control message protocol, which is ping. We have ARP, which is ARPIT's address resolution protocol, and that's the protocol that tries to connect a an IP address with a MAC address, which is your hardware address. And then you have reverse ARP, reverse address resolution protocol, which is the opposite of ARP, which means that uh, the computer needs to, to connect a MAC address with a particular uh, IP number. Once we moved up to there, we have the transport layer over here in the OSI model. We have the transport layer here. And the transport layer is broken down into two different segments, the TCP, Transmission Control Protocol and UDP, User Datagram Protocol. And if you recall anything about these two protocols is that this is connection oriented. So it's like making a telephone call, let's say, is that you establish a connection between two points and then you, uh, you have a reliable um, um, sharing of information between those two points and the user data user datagram protocol is called connection less oriented and it's it's called uh, a non-reliable protocol because essentially what happens is is that the data packets are uh, sent from one station to another but there's nothing that comes back from the second station that's the receiver that actually indicates whether all the packets were accepted in the correct order and we'll see why sometimes we have to use DCP for some communications and sometimes it's okay to use UDP. It's much more efficient to use UDP but you're going to get errors. <clears throat> and finally to make this very simple, uh, from the OSI model we take the session, presentation and application layers and we connect them into the application layer over here under the TCP IP model. And then we have the various specific application protocols that are located in the application layer. HTTP, uh, SMTP, domain name, service, SNMP, trivial file, transfer protocol, dynamic hosts, transfer protocol, FTP, and telnet, which all fall under the application layer. <coughs> Essentially what happens here is that when the application um, creates a packet, let's say at the uh, HTTP level, for it to be uh, sent to another station, <coughs> the receiver, and then the transport layer will add the appropriate information on here, which would be port information primarily, and then that would be sent down to the network layer, where the network layer would add the appropriate IP information, and then down here the appropriate MAC address information and other layering information is added. And so all this information that was sent, created from the application layer is actually encapsulated in a packet from information combined from all these other layers. And then that's sent through to another network station where let's say now the information is received. So this information is stripped off. So we know the MAC address. Here the IP address is stripped off. And then the, the port address is stripped off. And so it goes to the appropriate uh, MAC address, IP, and port address. And then the application layer, any information that's added on prior, uh, that is, to the uh, raw data is stripped off and then it's presented to the appropriate application here. <clears throat> okay, how can attackers gain access to networks? 
well, one thing an attacker needs to know is an IP address of a computer. If you're looking, if an attacker is looking for a particular computer, they have to know the IP address. It's like saying, I want to, um, I want to break into somebody's house, uh, Johnny Smith's house. Well, in order to break into his house, what do I need to know? I need to know the address of the house. The same thing with computers. However, a lot of times, I mean, that's a very targeted attack if you're talking about specifically targeting one person because nowadays uh, there's so many people on the Internet, what attackers do is really don't attack a particular person or a particular computer, but they look for the low-hanging fruit, that is, the computers that are not well protected, that are not well defended. And um, we know that the, uh, the IP address components, uh, or rather components of an IP address include the network address, the host address, and the subnet mask. So for example, let's flip over here quickly and look at some things. Uh, that's not the best way to show this. Let me jump back here and do some things. Uh, let me see. Pull this up so that, for example, we have um, the, what was the first thing we're talking about, the host address, the network address. The network address is the address of the network, which is going to end in 0, usually 2.168.0.1.0. This, this is going to be the address of the network, that is, um, all the computers that are located uh, behind the network with the same, are going to have the same network address. Uh, the host address is actually the address of the computer on that network. And so here you could have uh, anywhere from zero recall is the uh, network address. 255 is going to be the broadcast address. And then usually anything else between 1 and 254 can be a host address. In, in this case, that only makes sense if we have a subnet mask of 255.255.0. Essentially what happens is, is you take the, the bit um, you take the zeros and ones of that uh, constitute this address, and you you uh, exclusive or them with these. And what that does is that gives you the information we need for the host address. And so essentially, what this says is is that if this is the subnet mask, that means that this zero means that the only thing up here that is allowed to change is going to be that last octet. And so you're going to find host in between here and here. If we were to say, if we were to have something like this and a zero down here, then what this says is, is that this is, oh, by the way, the, what we saw before was a class C address. And I'm assuming this is a review for everybody. That's why I'm going through this quickly, but just to re refresh our memories. That's a class C address, what we had before. This is a class B address, which means now we're going to have, we can actually have numbers from 1 to 254 in here, and then one numbers from 1 to 254 in here. And so total, there's going to be a possibility of 255 times 255 equals uh, 65.535. I believe that's right. Different combinations of hosts that we can have, host IPs, on this network. So B's. Uh, network is going to have more hosts capable than C's. And if we went here, we would have a class A network, which then once again would be something like this. And I'm not going to do the math here. I can't remember how many. It's something like 10 million or something like that. Okay. That's just off the top of my head. Okay, so we know what constitutes an IP address. So how do we hide an IP address? Well, one way to do this uh, is to use a, <coughs> a certain uh, things like, a, let's say, network address translation can be used. And essentially what that does is, is, is network address translation takes is, uh, is used by a router and it translates a, an external IP address into another IP address. And usually these, these other IP addresses are going to be uh, private IP addresses. And there's a whole range of private IP addresses and in fact, one of the ones I was just showing here, this right here, 192.168.0.0, anything in this range are going to be private addresses. What do I mean by private? I mean that those addresses 
are not publicly publicly routable is that a router sh should drop any packets that have this as a source or a destination address. That doesn't always occur, but it's supposed to. And so essentially what, what it does is is you take one two two one seven zero one four nine dot let me just select one oh two. Is it that the um, as you have a public address of let's say this and so that will be your router's public address and then your router comes into here and I can't believe I'm doing this all on the fly actually drawing pictures and it takes the um, the router takes that and actually translates that to a private address so whatever you, your private address is in here and so uh, how does the router know so what you could have is is you could actually have many different computers with um, with addresses I'm not going to write out all these whoops behind this router one, two, whoops, one, two, dot, and so on behind this router but they all have the public address of 132 this number so how does a packet coming in here how does this router know where to send this well it's based upon the uh, the initiating port number that's used here by this computer and by this computer and by this computer and so depending upon what what port number is being chosen then the computer knows, the router knows wh which packet uh, that's coming in here is supposed to go to which private IP address that's located in here. And so, whoops, so essentially what that means is is that any computers outside of this network, whoops, any computers outside of this network don't have direct access to this computer or this computer or this computer. It doesn't have direct access to those IP addresses. It must do so through the router and that makes uh, for a very good defense although it's not foolproof. Uh, another thing you can do is use proxy servers are used to hide IP addresses and they kind of use the same um, the same um, um, not the same configuration, but the same ideas here, except what you have behind here, which this is going to be a proxy server, and these don't are not going to be private addresses. These can be public addresses in here. So 110.10.34.57.1.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
And so we have multiple layers of defense. We have a proxy server sitting here. We have a firewall in here as well. We have a router. And we have a network address translation in here. So it would be very difficult for a computer out here to be able to access any of these computers um, directly because of our layers of defense. And uh, IP address classes, something that I alluded to before. We have our class A, the first octet goes from 1 to 127. The default subnet mask, as I so showed before, is 255.0.0.0. Notice that there's also associated with this a private reserved address range. It goes from 10.0.0.1 to this number right here. Notice also that this is reserved for the local TCP local interface testing. And uh, because there's so many different uh, combinations in here, you could, we're talking about very large networks. So Class A networks are reserved for large corporations and governments. If we're talking about Class B, then we're talking about much larger, um, much larger networks. And here's our default subnet mask we talked about before. And notice that the Class B addresses uh, range from this to this. These are medium-sized networks. So even then, some of the larger corporations could be using several Class B networks. Class C networks, as we saw before, have the default range, so default subnet mask of this, and they range from this number here to this number here, and this is smaller networks. Notice this is the private reserved range in here, excuse me, private reserved range. Uh, Class D networks are used for multicasting. Multicasting means that your one computer can talk to many computers. And uh, Class E is used for experimentation, so you should actually.